Okay, just uh, a few seconds of introduction. This training course is specific for teachers coming from, I don't know, 20 European and extra European countries. And it's specific on micro, specific and special language concerning environment, pollution and science. Gordon is a specialist in his language skills. And uh, why? Because this has come out from a um, European project, a key activity, activity free centralized in Brussels project, a uh, policy reform project approved to us, and uh, with which we had a lot of, of our partners in this, uh, this meeting, and all of them are participating with the teacher from Portugal to Spain, from North Macedonia to Turkey, from uh, Poland to Romania and even out of this partnership. Why? Because we are creating a network of school plastic free. Uh, not only without plastic, but just uh, working in the school for, for a better future. Okay. That um, we are creating a network of schools that pays a lot of attention to the future of the planet and uh, working with kids from all over Europe and to give them possibility to substitute plastic, but also to think about recycling, work on water, and any elements in order to avoid pollution and the proper use of resources, of the uh, world resources. And uh, this network, it's within a bigger network, and we have all the members participating. Uh, we have created about pro-social values. We have created some years ago. It's called nobodyless.org, you can find it. And uh, this network is working for the pro-social values, empathy, solidarity, equal opportunity, generosity, uh, cooperation, multilingualism, multiculturalism, and also protecting the environment against any kind of harassment, bullying, prevarication, for peace, tolerance against any war, and this network, which has 17 countries, from India to Argentina, from Denmark to Turkey, uh, it's our main content, our main beam of uh, all our projects and activities. Okay, uh, so let me introduce you, Gordon, as uh, Kennedy. It's uh, our friend is working for our network in Italy. Uh, my name is Stefano Cobello. I'm coordinating a national network of education institutions in my country and more than 4,000 organizations. And we are also coordinating this European project, uh, School Plastic Free Network. Gordon has already taken for us a wonderful training course for teachers about science and education. He's an expert in a specific and uh, language skills and on the topic and uh, I already put it in the chat the link where you can put your presence and the full program so you can check when you can participate or not so don't worry if you cannot participate uh, because we will upload the record of the today lesson uh, maybe tomorrow on the website so you can recover in any moment anything you want Gordon, it's up to you. You are a master. Okay. Okay, so it's just the vagaries of, uh, well, the vagaries of uh, PDS. Okay. It's very beautiful, so you can start. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Stefano. Okay, so uh, good evening, everybody. I hope uh, I hope everyone is uh, is well. Uh, at the end, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday today. Yes, it is. So I hope everyone is well on this uh, on this Tuesday, and um, we are going to we're going to work together on over the next uh, next couple of uh, next hour and hour and a half hour and three quarters. Um, we're going to start this uh, the first edition uh, of. Environment, uh, environmental English version 1.0. Now, um, 
Stefano has given a, a sort of a brief introduction to uh, to uh, the to what we're going to do, um, but what I'd like to do uh, before getting into the uh, into the meat of the uh, material, I'd like to uh, flesh out a little bit what he has said. Now, um, I think the uh, the main thing that I would like to say at this moment in time is that the this is a new a new course. This is a new experience, and so um, you will have to let's say uh, bear with us uh, a little bit in terms of um, getting the uh, getting things right. So uh, I'm going to try and uh, do my best to uh, make this as clear. Uh, to, to make this uh, as clear and as uh, comprehensive as possible. Um, of course, if you have any feedback, please uh, please do uh, use the chat. But you do have to remember that um, I may be concentrating uh, on the uh, on the slides uh, and what I'm trying to say in order to. Uh, communicate the, the message and I may not uh, be watching the chat uh, constantly okay so let's uh, let's take this a little bit further so um, an introduction to the course um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we what we're trying to do in this excuse me what we're trying to do in this course um, now this is rather unusual for me because um, I do uh, do English work, language work, and I do science work with students. So I'm used to working with uh, classroom groups and sometimes even small groups. Um, I'm not <laughs> I'm not used to working with over a hundred people at the same time. So unfortunately, the modality of this is very much a let's say it's push it's a, a lecture type of modality um, that said I hope that at least um, you will be able to get some ideas um, and you will be able to get uh, maybe give me give some feedback at certain points during the uh, during the session so um, without further ado what is this course about? This course is um, uh, is about micro language for environmental topics. Now, um, Stefano, when Stefano asked me to uh, to do this course, um, I was a little bit, let's say, um, not so sure, simply because I was thinking, well, what do we? How do we do this? What do we? Uh, what do I need to put in uh, in a course like this? But the more I thought about it, um, the more I realized that um, just as I say when I'm doing my uh, my science, uh, when, my, when I'm doing my science activities, um, most of the language that is used in a conversation about a technical subject or a communication about a, a scientific subject, most of the language is actually framework, which is the basic language that you're using in everyday life. It's just that you're trying to get across uh, some particular um, particular concepts, particular ideas, and so that's where you might use some specialist terms. So the micro language is maybe more to do with some particular types of words, particular types of uh, ways of saying things which are used in particular areas, particular topics, particular sectors. and. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore a little bit the um, the micro language for being for talking about the environment. 
or topics to do with the environment because as you will see from the program um, the idea is really quite uh, it's really quite broad why why do this well two reasons one is to help you or to stimulate you to communicate with your colleagues in the network um, so we have uh, a, a more let's say a broader common language and the second reason is perhaps to transfer some of this micro language to uh, to classwork now maybe that will happen maybe it won't I don't know because I I think from the demographic we have quite a range of uh, different uh, uh, different school levels in terms of age groups so maybe some of this will be more appropriate uh, to different levels uh, but we will I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you will uh, you will work that uh, work that out okay so what is this course about um, it's for adult learners so teachers in this case um, and the idea is to help you maybe um, uh, let's say dust off your vocabulary uh, dust off your grammar maybe uh, brush it up a little bit um, what it isn't and I have to be very very clear about this at the start it's not about pedagogy okay this is not about teaching small how to teach how to teach language to small children um, I am not a specialist in uh, in uh, pedagogy and so this would that would really be out of out of place okay so this is really focused on uh, adult learners who maybe have not had a lot of chance to uh, to brush up their uh, their English or to keep their English um, up to date okay so um, moving forward uh, why are we here well I think it's fair to say that only, only you can answer that um, I know why I'm here which is to try and uh, communicate this uh, this material but uh, I assume that each of us will have a particular motivation for having signed up for this course that uh, Stefano has uh, is, promo is promoting so um, the course content okay so um, environmental English is a vast vast topic and it's so there's so much so many things that you could say about this that it all me almost sorry it almost becomes difficult to say anything in a way because it's difficult to uh, identify clearly um, particular areas so um, over the course of the uh, over the course of the, uh, the program we're going to look at uh, different aspects of uh, environmental English so I've identified eight macro areas and each of these macro areas has a number of subtopics in, in it so um, for example uh, we're going to start with uh, looking at uh, modern life um, and this is particularly uh, about technology in modern life we're going to look at um, aspects of the use of technology aspects of the of waste uh, which is a big obviously a big um, a big topic particularly in terms of communicating with uh, with young people um, energy how 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 um, energy is involved in the environment and our attitudes and our use of energy uh, attitudes towards energy and the use of energy conservation um, how uh, conservation projects fit into um, preserving natural habitats um, water which is an important uh, topic um, in and of its own right uh, pollution of course which is the um, the way uh, the way environmental uh, degradation 
happens. And we have something about land use, which may you may think, oh, that's a little bit strange, but land use is a very, very important part of um, it's a very important part of uh, thinking about the environment because the environment is not just reducing plastic, it's not just saving energy, it's not just uh, saving water and trying and using a bike instead of a car, it's also about bigger things such as uh, where our food comes from and uh, how, how we um, how we use uh, the resources that uh, that we have in the environment that we have around us. Okay, so um, just in case you're wondering, this is not me. Um, uh, the modality. This will be uh, done as a, sesh, a set of uh, two-hour sessions online. Um, I think the sessions have been recorded. And each session will be divided into sections, will be divided into sub-chapters, if you like. Um, my idea to start with was to give a little bit of space for question and answer at the end of each section, rather than uh, waiting for the end of the, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole session of the two hours. Um, I don't know how, how feasible this is, so... Um, we're going to test this, okay? So, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to cover some uh, micro language, as I've uh, as I pointed out, and we're going to look at um, some associated grammar forms. But I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to do uh, any sort of heavy uh, heavy grammar uh, at all, um, because I think. My personal opinion is that uh, grammar comes uh, when you need it, but what you need, first of all, I think, is words, and in particular, verbs, because verbs <coughs> are action, and so that's my that's my personal um, my personal uh, approach to things. Okay, so um, the course is going to last. Uh, until early next year, um, which when I saw, when I put this down as a calendar, I thought, good lord! <laughs> um, but actually, it's only 16 sessions. It's only um, it's only two sessions per month, except for May this year, because we've started a little bit late um, to recover a little bit of time. There will be three sessions in May. Okay. Um, we're going to have a summer break, so uh, there will be nothing in June, July, and August, and then we will restart again in September. Um, so the calendar is this. Now I don't expect you to read all of this because it's it's just here for reference more than anything. Um, but the you can see that I have quite a quite a, a range of of different uh, of different topics with the sub subtopic areas. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff to um, a lot of stuff to think about, a lot of stuff, a lot of vocabulary, and a lot of uh, a lot of language to uh, to go through. Of course, uh, one of the uh, one of the problems uh, associated with doing something like this is that this is not a traditional lesson. I have very little interaction. I can't see the people who I'm talking to, and so it's difficult for me to judge whether um, the uh, let's say the level is the right level. Okay, uh, it's difficult for me to judge whether um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, if you like, I'm going in the right direction. So, uh, hopefully, uh, at the end of the session, maybe uh, you can feed back to Stefano or feed back to myself, so that um, I can uh, I can uh, judge how to uh, manage things uh, going forward. Of course, the other aspect is that this cannot be a traditional. Um, uh, this cannot be a traditional 
um, language type lesson because we can't do group readings and I can't do closed activities and all of that good stuff. Okay, so this is uh, this is a modality which is a little bit uh, a little bit strange for you. Okay, introductions. So as Stefano alluded to. Uh, I have been living in Italy for quite a long time actually, but I'm obviously not Italian. Um, I grew up in the north of England, in the northeast of England actually. I remember when pterodactyls flew from the, from the cliffs of Whitby. Um, and in fact, uh, I, was, I grew up on the Jurassic coast in, of North Yorkshire, which is, probably explains the Ammonite. Uh, I used to go looking for these on the beach. Um, this is the sort of coastline. Uh, it's uh, quite, it's quite pretty. It's quite beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful coastline. Although the sea is um, pretty cold. <laughs> okay, um, I grew up in a an industrial town, which is uh, it's not this, but this sort of represents it. Um, and so uh, I was surrounded by, let's say, sort of technology, science, um, earth sciences, and nature, and this sort of led me to uh, to um, gravitate towards a scientific career. Um, I started uh, I started life as a as a chemist. I worked as um, after a PhD in bioorganic chemistry, I worked in industry for a long time as a researcher. So when when I talk to people about research, um, it's very much uh, as we as we would say as as, as we would as one would say in, in Italian, vita vissuta, which means it's a lived life because this was part of uh, part of my everyday um, getting up and. Uh, messing around in the lab, doing experiments, getting getting my hands dirty, if you like. Um, so <clears throat> all of this sort of comes together um, to to bring me to my my latest, let's say, incarnation. Now you're probably wondering what this place is. This place is York. Um, some of you may have been to York. It's an old medieval city. It's actually a Roman city, Eboracum was the name. Um, it's an old medieval city in the northeast of England. Very beautiful place if you get the chance to go there. This is where I was born, not here, but in the city of York. Okay, So I have this strong interest, strong passion about science, and I'm just absolutely fascinated by technology, not in the sense of being a... a um, a Linux nerd or whatever, I don't do informatics, but I'm fascinated by how things get made uh, and how things can be how things can be converted and uh, in from one thing to another. So okay, so uh, over the last maybe seven, eight, seven years maybe, something like this, um, I've been developing a a project which is called Talking About Science. And this project works uh, above all with older students, um, and it's very much about mixing the science with the language, because over well since the since the since the 1950s or so, the um, <clears throat> the language of science has switched from being sort of fairly, let's say, fairly mixed to being predominantly English. It, so English has become, in a way, it has become the new Latin. And uh, so it's, it because it's very important for uh, students, I think, to, and particularly those students who are about to go to university, to um, understand that uh, it's not about being the new Shakespeare, it's about being able to communicate uh, easily and fluently with uh, other people in other countries 
in order to share ideas and build uh, build the future, let's say. So uh, talking about science is very much a, uh, a project based on experiential learning. So as you can see, I've got two examples here. Um, one is a, <laughs> it was a nice uh, project about extracting limonene from lemons. And this was a project we took to science on stage a few years ago. Um, below, you have students who are working with uh, some software to uh, look at molecules. So um, this is done in a, a, a CLEAL type of environment, content language and integrated learning type of environment, which is um, typically based on laboratory work where possible. OK, um, so OK, so I hope that that is sort of giving you a brief introduction to who who I am. Um, it would be interesting for me to know who you are, but uh, there are too many of you <laughs> out there. So. Um, so modern life. I'm going to start with uh, I'm going to start with this uh, this chapter on modern life. So um, I don't know how many of you remember from the 1990s. Uh, Blur was a, a famous uh, a famous Brit pop band. I think they were, and they <laughs> they produced this CD, which is uh, uh, Modern Life is Rubbish. Well. I'm not sure about rubbish, but certainly complicated in some ways. Um, so what, what are we going to look at here? Um, I'm going to look at some familiar aspects of modern life, and in particular, uh, familiar aspects to do with technology and how we use it, um, and things around us which we may be, we take for granted. Um, but which are part of our environment, OK? Obviously, there is not a lot of time to go into any great depth. Um, so uh, we will have to sort of uh, take, what, uh, take what we get. So um, I'm looking to make some connections between ideas and vocabulary uh, and hopefully hopefully I will um, not mis <laughs> I will not mispronounce too many things and you may be able to take some uh, take something away from um, uh, in the, take something away regarding uh, pronunciation um, I just have to I just have to point out one thing which is that um, being from the north of England, uh, I I grew up with um, a particular way of saying the vowels. Now, this isn't an incorrect way of saying the vowels. It's just that they tend to be very northern, which is they're quite flat. OK, so um, this uh, having said that, people do say that my pronunciation is relatively uh, is relatively Oxford-like, so um, there won't be too many, let's say, f strange ways of saying things, hopefully. Okay, so today's session, we're going to look at um, things around us in our everyday life. We're going to look at moving people and moving things. We're going to look at some technologies which we uh, use every day, or that we use every day. And we're going to look at something about food. Now, I've chosen these topics because I think this is a good way to start, because uh, they're relatively familiar. So some of this is really quite general language. And it, it comes back to, the, uh, to what I said about framing, which is that the... Um, the, most of the time when you're sort of talking to people about uh, stuff that's technical or stuff that's scientific, most of the time the, the language is actually, it's the supporting parts of the sentence which are holding the, the science words together. Okay, so 
part of this is looking at some of these supporting uh, supporting words. Um, I've chosen uh, moving people and moving things to talk about transport, uh, transportation. Uh, we will look at some uh, some things about that. Um, food, something about diet, which is uh, something which is which is important, obviously, from a, at a personal level, <coughs> but from an, an, eco an ecological, environmental perspective, there is the question of the impact of food uh, production. Um, but we're not going to go into the details of that today. We're just going to touch the, the surface of diet, let's say. Um, and the technologies. Well, the technologies, it's quite clear that um, if it weren't for the technologies, we, <laughs> we wouldn't be doing this. And having said that, even though I did do a test the other day, um, the video has decided not to work this time. So who knows? But the technology is around us. Technology is something that we have to live with, something that can be, it can be good and it can be bad. So, okay, so let's, uh, let's move on now. Okay, so my first, my first, uh, my first topic is what I'm going to call peak stuff. Now, peak stuff. I can imagine that if you're not, uh, if you're not so <coughs> uh, used to, uh, if you're not so used to English, you might be thinking, what does this mean? Well. Um, when was it? 60s, 1960s, 1970s, people started to talk about a concept which was called peak oil. And peak oil is the idea that at some point um, society was using as much oil as was coming out of the ground and it couldn't it couldn't use any more because there wasn't any more to use um, and the idea was that we'd reached an apex so the the idea of the peak is this apex it's like the top of the mountain um, now as far as oil is concerned uh, peak oil hasn't really completely peaked yet. It's still uh, we're still using more and more, and pip and companies and uh, governments are still finding more and more oil. Um, they're also working out ways to make it from uh, from things which maybe uh, would be best left in the in the ground, such as the oil, uh, the tar sands in Alberta, for example. But the stuff here refers to things, refers to objects, things that you may have around you. Okay, so if you just take a quick look around you now, um, I'm aware that we may have some Scandinavian minimalists on the call, so maybe this doesn't apply too much to you, um, but if you want to see peak stuff, maybe you should have a look in my garage. Um, it's not quite like that. This isn't my garage. I don't like these sorts of hats, but um, quite quite a lot of people uh, have a lot of stuff around them. And if you just look, just cast your eyes over these things, um, first of all, there are lots of different things. Um, but what are these things? So uh, you will have all sorts of things which maybe um, you could set how many how many remote controls do you have? Uh, so it seems like these days if you buy anything uh, with a plug, it has a remote control attached to it. Although now, uh, of course, it's the app that you put on your on your telephone. Um, why why do we have these things? Why did you get these pieces? What uh, what were you doing? For what, you, what were you intending to do with them? What do you use them for? Quite often we have things around us which we, uh, which we accumulate, but then they live the rest of their lives in a cupboard. 
Um, we can ask, what are these things made of? So I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at some glass bottles here. I'm looking at a, a jar of jam, okay, which is actually holding up a webcam, which uh, uh, it's acting as counterweight. But we have some glass, we have some metal, we have some paper on the label, okay. Um, the jam itself is jam that we made uh, last year, so I know where the jam came from. Um, but there's all, there's all sorts of things here. I've got plastic pens, I've got a metal pen, uh, I've got at least two mice, computer mice, not real mice. Um, I've got webcams, there's all sorts of things, okay? So um, the idea here is to just think about objects and what they are, why they are there, and how can we describe them? So. An article which I came across uh, as I was preparing this uh, this material was um, an article in the LA Times which talked about uh, it gave this statistic, which is, or these two statistics, I should say. Um, so it's estimated that an average American home, so this is data for America, contains about 300,000 different objects. Now, I don't know whether 300,000 is a big number or a small number, to be honest with you, um, because a few, a few weeks ago, I was doing, um, a, <coughs> I was uh, doing a, a backup of, my, of, my, of one of my computers, and um, I just had to look at how many files were in this computer, and it was over 150,000. Now, of course, many of these are systems files and they're little files and they're doing particular jobs in the system. But this just gives you an idea of the complexity of the thing. Um, and then I started to look around the house and I was thinking, good Lord, there's a lot of stuff here. So um, maybe 300,000 is, 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 uh, is, is not a big number. I don't know. Um, so... Uh, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. children uh, statistic here is that the U.S. children constitute about four percent of all the children in the world. Okay, but they actually have more than, or just about, not more than, just about half of all the toys in all the children's books. And I think it would be fair to say that we could add, um, particularly for. Uh, the richer parts of Europe, we could add uh, add things in, add, add this statistic in there, and um, what we will find is that, of course, we live in, particularly in the West, we're living in a, a society which is um, which gives us a lot of things, so we have a lot of stuff. <laughs> so I was just saying, uh, Victoria uh, is saying too much. I love empty space. It's good for the nerves. Well, yes, Victoria, but at the same time, some people find this type of situation comforting. You're surrounded by the objects that you love. You, you, you're surrounded by um, the books which you grew up with or the books that you enjoy reading. Okay, um, so a lot of this stuff that people talk about is actually a product of, let's say, um, sometimes it's a product of, ri of rich lives in the, s in the sense of interactions with people, mementos and uh, reminders and sentimental reasons uh, for, keeping, uh, for keeping things. Um, I'm at the same time, it can get a little bit, uh, can get a little bit obsessive. Um, I am reminded of a, uh, of a, of a, it's a sort of a, a saying which was, um, uh, which was that you know that you've turned into your father when you find a stick, a piece of wood in the garage, and rather than throw it away, you put it to one side because maybe it will be useful for stirring paint sometime. So. Uh, uh, people 
keep stuff for all sorts of things. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not sure uh, who M. Carmen is, but he or she, I think it's a she, is saying, mainly talking about books, I usually say that I, I have disordered order. That sort of corresponds to my situation, I would say, I think. Um, so we can think, how many of those books have you actually read? I've got quite a few books which I say, yeah, yeah, OK, I get, I get it. And then I decide, well, maybe um, uh, I'll read it later, I'll read it later. And five years later, I still haven't read it. Same thing for the CDs. Although CDs these days, who collects CDs or who... Who buys CDs? Uh, it's all Spotify, and it's you have um, you have more space in your telephone for for music than you probably have time in your life to listen to it. So uh, this is also part of the uh, this is also part of the um, uh, let's say the the, the modern uh, the modern ethos, which is lots and lots of stuff and instantly but a lot of this stuff is also disappearing it's also becoming um, digital and digital and can also be uh, can also be a problem okay so let's sort of take a, a step sort of uh, I wouldn't say to step down but a step closer to the actual objects themselves okay so um, one of the things we can uh, we can talk about, or things that we can talk about, are not one of the things. Things that we can talk about are physical characteristics, because the physical characteristics of objects uh, sometimes these things can be very uh, very emotive. Um, so you may have from the functional, which is what does the object look like. What is it supposed to do? Um, what is it made of? How does it behave? Now, I'm not, I'm not necessarily, re I'm not necessarily referring to um, to robots uh, and things which are autonomous, but um, is it is it something which is uh, uh, which is static? Is it something which is moving? Um, what is its surface like? So I'm thinking, I'm just t touching my phone at the moment, and you have a touch screen which is obviously smooth and, and glass-like. Um, it's got a cover which is actually plastic, uh, or, well, yes, it's a pseudo-leather type of thing, but I think it's really plastic. Um, but it it feels like leather to to an extent. So um, we have different types of different types of surfaces, different types of feel. Okay. Um, so we can use the physical characteristics to of an object to describe to be able to compare things. So if you like, the first part of uh, the grammar thing is I'm not going to go into the rules of um, uh, of adjectives and comparatives and superlatives, but uh, what I'd like to suggest is that um, th these are the words, these are part of the framing language, which is, uh, it's really important to get, uh, to get a solid base in because it allows you to communicate in a f very fluid way, in a fluid manner, because we're always comparing things. Um, and I don't mean sort of uh, in terms of people, but we're always comparing objects and um, uh, describing things in terms of this is harder than that or this is stronger than this. Okay, so uh, typical forms you may come across pencils, for example. Pencils can be different uh, levels of hardness. While we're on the subject of pencils, pencils contain uh, graphite, which is uh, um, a carbon mineral. Um, Remember that pencils are not pure graphite. It's actually graphite dust um, amalgamated with a type of uh, a type of let's say glue, if you like, to hold it together. Um, 
You can even make scales of, uh, of hardness, and you can do this with pencils, of course, because you can go from uh, 6H to 6B. And it's interesting, it's a nice, uh, it's a very tactile thing to do, is to take, the, uh, to take a piece of paper and uh, draw lines with these different types of uh, with these different types of pencils and see what type of mark you can make on the paper. Um, the other example of scales which uh, is refers to hardness is of course the Mohs scale. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are science teachers or have science backgrounds so um, <coughs> forgive me if I fall into the temptation to get a little bit more let's say specialist but the most scale is um, is simply a way of describing how some how uh, one mineral is harder or softer than the next and we start with uh, talc which is the softest and we finish with diamond which is the hardest okay so um, we can sort of take this a little bit further and <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm looking at uh, a list here now um, as I was putting these materials together excuse me as I was putting these materials together I was I sort of realized that well it would be very easy it would be very easy for this to become a quite simply to become a, uh, a list of words and that's not so useful let's say and it's also pretty boring for two hours okay already you're listening for me listening to me for two hours so this is uh, this is uh, makes it even worse if it's just a, a list um, but what uh, what I wanted to say here was that um, it can be extremely useful when you are um, thinking about descriptions to try and find opposites and try and work with the opposites and try and remember the opposites so um, sometimes words don't have an obvious opposite and an obvious antonym um, sometimes they do so classic example of course is uh, we have strong we have weak we have flexible we have rigid we have smooth, we have rough, uh, we have stretchy, which is something which is like elastic. Uh, but, well, something that is stretchy, the opposite would be something which is rigid. Okay, so um, the idea here is that uh, by remembering or by working with these things as, uh, as pairs, they can become easier to... Uh, easy to remember and easy to recall. Um, some of these are a little bit more technical <coughs> but uh, also have uh, also have uses in broader uh, language so if we take transparent and opaque you can talk about um, you can talk about a, uh, a process or a thing uh, an interaction being transparent or you can talk about it being opaque in other words you don't really know what's going on um, something can absorb it can be absorbent uh, something can repel it can be repellent we have things like fibrous so this is fibrous um, we might have uh, things which are scratched for example which is a, um, a some sort of uh, mark on a on a on a <clears throat> on a surface where you've uh, you've uh, indented into the surface maybe with a harder piece of uh, material um, you can have something which is dense something which is uh, a small piece you pick it up but it seems very heavy uh, something which is light polystyrene for example um, is you can pick up a big piece and it hardly weighs anything. Um, metallic, this is some gallium actually, um, and non-metallic, so this is like this wall here. Okay, so um, 
physical properties useful to remember in pairs. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole list. Don't worry. But you can have uh, uh, you can have other types of um, uh, types of uh, blah, 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 types of physical properties. Uh, so we've got the classic, which is the soft and the hard and the thin and the thick, the tough and the fragile. Um, we've got elastic, rigid, magnetic, repellent. So this can also uh, apply to people. Something more technical, an insulator, a conductor. Um, crystalline, plastic. Okay, so there's lots of, uh, lots of possibilities for, um, uh, for uh, descriptions. So moving, uh, moving forward, okay, so we are uh, clearly surrounded by many different types of materials. Um, so if we take, for example, wood, uh, there are many different types of wood and they are used for different things. So um, you would use teak uh, for, uh, for things which need to last a long time, things which need to be tough, because teak is an extremely tough, uh, an extremely hard wood. Um, you would use uh, maybe birch for other things because it's flexible. Okay. Um, now I've made the I've made the point here that um, we also have many different types of plastic, and I would invite you to I'd invite you to look around you and see if you can identify how many different pieces or how many different types of plastic you can find, um, because part of this. Uh, Part of this uh, this project is the idea of the plastic-free school. Now, to be absolutely honest with you, I don't think we could really do without plastic. But what we do need to do is we do need to think about how we use it because there is use and there is abuse. And in many cases, plastic exists and is used because it replaces traditional materials which do not have the physical characteristics which are required in that particular use. So um, I'm just looking for <laughs> just looking for example at my microphone uh, and I'm looking at my uh, webcam. Now I think I can't imagine a, a wooden webcam. Um, you know, maybe the outside, and it's okay. It's going to look quite. Uh, it's going to look quite nice. Uh, but inside, and inside my microphone, we have a lot of um, plastic in terms of the uh, circuits, in terms of the um, the electronic parts. So um, there is a lot of stuff here, which I think. Um, which I think we uh, we do take for granted, and sometimes, and often, not some, not sometimes, but often, we abuse. Um, and I think it's particular. Well, well, we'll talk about plastic plastic later on in the course. Okay. Um, so uh, thinking about materials in general. So some materials we can reuse, um, metals, for example. Uh, although the metals that are in our in our telephone. In our smartphones and in our computers are more are uh, possibly more valuable, but certainly more difficult to recycle. Um, in fact, I saw a, a statistic a while ago which said that um, there is now more gold in a ton of smartphones than there is in a ton of rock. It's more difficult to get the gold out of the smartphones than it is to get it out of the rock. <laughs> okay, so this gives us a, a, a perspective on the thing. Um, okay, so some things can be reused, some things can be recycled, some things are more difficult to recycle, so you maybe need energy, and we will cover these types of things. Other things, 
you just can't recycle them at all. Uh, they uh, they reach the end of their useful life, and that's it. Nothing to do. Nothing. You can't do anything. Okay, so common materials. Um, I've got some leather in the background, and uh, I have a particular uh, I have a particular soft spot for leather because I work with uh, some of the projects I do are with a. Um, uh, a school for students of leather up in, uh, in uh, up near Vicenza. Okay, so let me just get back. I don't need those. Um, so uh, we have things like wood, we have plastic, metal, brick, stone, concrete, glass, ceramic, crystal, paper, rock, and each of these. Uh, thinking about the um, the vocabulary. Uh, to build the vocabulary, you can um, use, uh, you can try and remember the words, try and remember the, the nouns, try and remember the nouns with the adjectives. Um, and sometimes there are also verbs asso asso associated with them too. Um, some of these verbs are uh, quite common, some of these are not. Is it possible to have these slides after the meeting? Uh, not at the moment because it's still being in, uh, it's still being um, developed. So uh, if you can just be a little bit patient, okay? Um, so we've got uh, we've got um, wood, woody or wooden. Um, plasticky is a bit of an unusual word, but it does exist. It looks a bit strange, um, but you. You've got lots of different ways to um, lots of different ways to uh, to describe things. Some words like concrete or brick or ceramic don't have an adjective; they're just made of ceramic. It's a material itself. Okay. Um, okay. So, what about fabrics? Well, um, fabrics are also a very important part of uh, everyday life and um, if again if you look around you um, you will find or see what you're wearing um, you will have probably a mix of things um, and so we can go everywhere every, everywhere from um, excuse me natural fibers such as wool such as wool leather um, I put feathers in there. They're not really fibres, but they are used in clothing sometimes. Um, fur, cotton, linen, flax. There's a whole there's the whole universe of fibres in there. Um, but then, of course, we also have the man-made fibres, uh, the synthetic fibres, uh, such as nylon, the polyesters, the polyamides, um, and here I was just thinking about this because the one of the one of the let's say um, one of the driving forces for the development of uh, of man-made fibers was to um, substitute natural fibers and the uh, the classic uh, example is the development of nylon. Uh, nylon is in its first form, nylon 66. Now, for the Italian speakers here, um, we have to be, I, I know I have to be a little bit careful because, uh, for example, my mother in law uh, talks about nylon, but actually she means polyethylene. Um, I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, uh, a lot of people of her generation. Um, use the word nylon it, almost like a generic plastic term. Okay. Um, however, nylon in its original form was developed in the 1930s by um, uh, Carruthers, a guy called Carruthers, Wallace Carruthers, who worked at he was working at Dupont, I think, um, and he, they were looking for a substitute for silk. Uh, they 
working for a uh, looking for a substitute for silk and silk of course is one of those fibers which has um, it's has fantastic properties uh, but it's also extremely expensive um, it is it has great uh, <coughs> it's comfortable to wear it's very it's luxurious uh, but it's also very practical because it's very warm and I think the, uh, the, the the driving force obviously was to bring a type of silk to the masses. Well, uh, events sort of took over, and um, uh, t towards ni <coughs> towards nineteen well nineteen thirty eight nineteen thirty nine um, nylon nylon stockings started to be produced for ladies in America. Um, but of course, 1940, 1941, America entered the war, the Second World War, and so uh, all of the nylon production switched to military use, um, where it was used for making ropes, it was used for making bags, it was used for making all sorts of stuff, and above all, it was used for making parachutes, because uh, nylon 6.6 six and nylon 6 were... Um, uh, in terms of the the weight and the strength, they were very very close to silk. Okay, um, and then after the war, of course, uh, it was mass produced, and a lot of things became uh, a lot of variations were developed, such as the polyesters and the uh, the other polyamides, not just nylon, um, and a whole set of polyacrylics and well. There's just a, a universe of stuff out there. But coming back to why would you do this? Well, okay, uh, in, at the beginning it was economics, but it also became clear that many of these modern fibers have much better performance characteristics with respect to uh, something like a, a fur coat or with respect to a cotton jacket. Um, and so there is a, a strong, let's say, push to, there was a strong push to develop um, technical, more technical materials. Now, I'm just not just talking about niche mountaineering gear. Um, I'm talking about um, materials which are uh, longer lasting and which are uh, able to um, <coughs> carry out specific, uh, specific functions. Um, at the same time, <coughs> I'm also reminded of um, <coughs> I'm also reminded of uh, uh, <coughs> the um, uh, the Amundsen Museum in Oslo, where uh, there was a, a very good exhibition or exhibit of um, the sorts of uh, of sorts of gear that uh, Roald Amundsen and his uh, his team used to. Uh, get to the South Pole and basically they used natural materials uh, natural um, uh, na natural uh, not textiles but skins which were um, prepared by Inuit and the Inuit had developed a technology a level of technology which was far superior even to the the, the technical um, uh, the technical garments. Okay, so different types of fibres. Um, so we can uh, <coughs> we can go forward and we can think about what about water? Uh, we are um, a high percentage of our bodies is water. Water is all around us. Uh, it's one of those uh, one of those materials which we can see quite easily transforming. It evaporates. Uh, a drop of water will evaporate. Uh, a drop of water will freeze if you leave it overnight. Um, it has the magical property of dissolving things. So I uh, take a I take a, a, a tea bag or a, a bag of um, of the um, of the dried forest fruits to make a um, to make a um, a type of fruit tea, and I put it in the water, and the water goes from colourless, transparent, to uh, a beautiful purple colour. A 
And why is this happening? Well, because soluble uh, things are moving out from the uh, from the from the the tea bags or from the uh, the uh, the leaves or the, the the dried fruits, and they're moving into the uh, into the water to become a solution. Um, you freeze it, we get ice. Uh, you can watch a transition, which is to uh, to melt. The ice will melt, and um, if you keep heating the melted ice, obviously it becomes water, and it will become warm water, and eventually it will become steam. It will evaporate, and so you've got different states. State is a very, let's say, is a more technical term, but it is uh, it is uh, the correct term to describe um, solids, liquids, gases. What state is this in? Um, is something wet? Is it dry? Is it absorbing the water? Is it repelling the water? Um, and then we have things which don't seem to be quite. Uh, one thing or another. What about a foam? If you take foam, I'm thinking of um, uh, the lines in uh, Scarborough Fair. Um, to find me an acre of land between the sea foam and the sea sand. Foam, um, foam is is a natural thing. It can also be a a man-made thing. But basically, what is it? Well, it's a it's a gas which is dispersed in a solid and uh, or it could be a gas which is dispersed in a liquid because you can have for example when you're washing the pots I don't know whether people still do wash the pots these days or whether people use machines um, when you when you wash the pots and you put in your soap and you mix it all up and it sort of goes all bubbly um, you've got you've got a foam uh, at the same time, you can have a foam like um, a polyurethane foam. So if you've ever done any work on surrounds of, of windows where you have to uh, maybe insulate the surrounds of a window, you use a foam which comes out of a canister, it fills the space and then it sets and it goes hard. So we have... Um, solids liquids gases and and some things in between this is something that we can we can look at at some other point in the uh in the in the in the course of the um the sessions okay so uh comparing materials so uh we have um uh this is the classic comparisons more than less than uh, leather is more flexible than steel, uh, wood is stronger than paper, glass is more transparent than paper. Um, which is more elastic, plastic or copper? It does depend on which plastic you're talking about. Um, which is the hardest material? What is the hardest material? So, um, again, uh, we're talking about... Uh, we're talking about um, describing physical characteristics of materials okay surfaces and what have you okay um i'm just going to i'm just going to stop for for a few minutes because i'd like to ask if anyone has any questions because this is a chance to uh not go let's say not go running uh too far too fast um so does anybody have any any questions and you could you can put them, I think you can put them on the chat if you do have. So let me just say, I still can't, I still cannot get my uh, vi video. Is it going to work? No. Anybody got any questions? Ah, now I can see myself. I don't know whether that means whether you can see me. We can see you now. Ah, okay. So I better switch the video. <coughs> I'd better switch the video off. So there I am in all my glory. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. So. <laughs> okay. Let me just. Uh, 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, it is such a. Oops. I've got an old keyboard here. I try to. I do try to recycle things. Um, I've got an old keyboard, and it's got the. You know those keys that are like twelve feet high, and it's like. Uh, it's like I'm sort of typing like this because I've got used to. Um, I got used to a laptop keyboard, and it's really flat. So. Okay. Um, uh, right. Okay. So Maria is saying uh, it takes a time. It takes time to collect all the words. Um, well, yeah. The thing. The thing is, I think that um, if you think about your own language when you're talking to people, when you're talking about things, you, you will find that you, you you use these words all the time. Uh, they're actually quite uh, quite common, but what happens, I think, with a lot of um, uh, with a lot of language stuff is that we use things and we just don't see, we just don't uh, we just don't think about, them. and uh, so we tend to we tend to concentrate on maybe um, uh, particular aspects of grammar or particular aspects of this or that uh, but in in reality a lot of it is just totally normal stuff okay so um, okay so if, if no one has any uh, any particular any particular questions um, I'm going to I'm going to take the opportunity to move uh, to move forward and um, I'm just sort of keeping an eye on the time, but I, I realise that uh, I probably won't finish everything I have today. So what I don't cover this time, I will pick up at the beginning of next time. So, um, okay. So one of the one of the topics which I wanted to sort of to to raise was um, the idea of uh, transport, which is moving people. And moving things, and um, as, a, as as quite often happens, um, as I think about things, quite often songs come into my mind. Now I'm not. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. Um, but the song which came to uh, came to my mind here was an old uh, Bert, uh, Bert Bacharach song which is planes and boats and trains, because I think I heard it on the radio uh, not so long ago, so it, it reminded me, and it's, it, stuck in my, it stuck in my mind. So, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the possibly the version that most people know, which is uh, Dion Warwick, although she was at Dion Warwick, although she wasn't the, uh, the original um, singer. It was originally a, a group about a year before her. Uh, but uh, trains and boats and planes are passing by. They mean a trip to Paris or Rome to someone else, but not for me. The trains and boats and planes took you away, away from me. It's a lovely song. It's got a, it's got a great, uh, it's got a, a great melody. So um, if you don't know it, I'd suggest you go and have a look at it. Um, okay, so travel. Um, <laughs> I laugh because, um, of course, there is an epidemic, there's a pandemic going on. So this is one thing which has definitely uh, been reduced, um, I think, over, over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, people have got used to travelling around a lot. And if I may add, travelling around a lot for no particular reason in many cases, uh, just to travel around. Now, it's this, let's say this is part of the, this is part of the, uh, let's say the, of the ethos of the, um, uh, of the environmental, let's say, uh, aspect of, of the subject, which is, well, 
it's one thing traveling to the other side of the world because you have to go and see some people your family or your your friends uh, or for business i don't know but just because you'd like to see the other side of the world i don't know i'm not so i'm not so sure but what i would like to suggest is um tomorrow when you go out of your house if you can go out of your house because i don't know whether you're in in lockdown but if you can at least look out of the window and look up at the sky um you will notice i think that uh whereas two years ago the sky was just completely oops, completely crisscrossed with uh contrails with white lines nowadays these days it seems like every so often you might see an aircraft but there's definitely enough there are definitely not so many of them so i think this is a, an indication of um how let's say how much travel has been uh, has been reduced um okay so without going into the the ethics of traveling around uh, i could wax on about that for a long time okay um <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> I actually hate it. <laughs> it it's uh, it's hard enough for me to get to the end of my garden path rather than uh, leave the uh, leave the country. So, okay, so do you like traveling? Do you like to travel? How often do you travel? Why do you travel? Where do you go to? So within traveling, I mean traveling we often think about like this guy's going on holiday, but well traveling is moving around. So how do you get to work? How did you come to school? Uh how do you come to school today or how did you come to school today? Um what is the best way <laughs> something like washing uh, brain brain what brainwashing is something else I think. <laughs> um okay, um what is the best way of getting around your city so i don't know where i don't know the demographic here i don't know who is uh, who lives where um but i can imagine that if you're in if you're in the northern maybe northern country uh you might have uh trams you might have buses you might have bikes um can you use a bike to go to to go to school or to go to work or do you live too far away um do you have an electric bike now uh if you don't but you're thinking about it i'd strongly suggest you do because uh there's a a study published in norway of all places uh which showed that people who were given a uh people who were given an electric bike um tended to use it a lot more than just if they had a normal bike and the reasons they give the reasons they gave were that um it's obviously easier than normal cycling um but it's more convenient than getting the car out to do short journeys so um i i got a, an electric bike a few years ago and i can say that uh, uh, i've been I've managed to leave the car in the garage a lot more since I since I got that. Okay, so modes of transport um we're talking about people mostly here. Uh so you go by rail on railways, you use trains, passenger trains, goods trains. Uh goods trains are the trains which transport materials and items and products and cars and uh things that will be used to make other things um trams are on rails typically um the metro or the underground um or the tube if you're in london um you have monorails which is a single rail uh you can go by air we have airways we have aeroplanes or airplanes aircraft helicopters um there are other ways of traveling which are maybe not quite so convenient uh, such as hot air balloon um zeppelin but they're a little bit more air um 
they're a little bit more uh, uh, esoteric, let's say. Um, roads, we have country lanes, we have motorways, we have uh, normal roads, we have dual carriageways. Um, water, you use waterways, so um, uh, not far from where I grew up in northern England, uh, if you go to the south of Yorkshire and sort of more to the centre of the country, um, the the whole area is crossed with canals and uh, the canal network was the way of moving materials around in the Industrial Revolution before the advent of railways. Um, you, ha you might have ships, you can have container ships, you have super tankers, you have, uh, I'm just thinking about what happened in the Suez Canal last week, um, where the, uh, some of these ships are so large that uh, they, can, uh, they can be a problem if things go wrong. Um, and then we've got pipeline. Uh, but pipelines, well, we don't, tra we don't usually transport people with pipelines. We usually transport liquid goods. So oil, uh, water, uh, gas, uh, what have you. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, what about uh, your journey? How far are you going? Are you going near? Are you going far? Are you going by public transport? Are you using a private car? Are you using private transport? Um, are you traveling on your own? Are you, tra are you traveling with people? Are you going with a group? Uh, so these are all sort of considerations that you might want to make. Um, looking at uh, ways of getting around, in particular, this might be uh, ways of getting around in the city. So uh, we have a nice um, tram from Lisbon here. Uh, if you've ever if you've ever been to Lisbon, you will recognise these. These are quite iconic. Um, but in cities, uh, many people take the bus. You take uh, you take the bus, and the people the bus takes people around the towns and cities. Uh, if you take a coach, a coach is something which typically is a, it's like a bus, but it will travel between cities. Um, if you uh, are in a big city like London or New York or Paris, then you'll take the underground, the tube or the metro uh, to, to get around. Um, trains, you can have local trains which, go, which stop at all of the stations and take three days to arrive where they're getting to, uh, or intercity trains, which are for longer journeys between different, uh, different, different places. Um, the tram, this is the Lisbon tram. Lisbon is famous for its trams. Um, it's curious, I think, that uh, many, many, European, many European cities have uh, tram networks. Um, uh, the UK, uh, well, um, the tram networks were disbanded after just well, yeah, just after the Second World War because they were thought as being old-fashioned, um, and then at great expense by the 1990s, many cities were starting to put them back in again. So it was probably better just to keep what uh, what people had. Um, Trams are, uh, a, a, again, a characteristic way of moving around. Um, taxis, private cars, which are for hire. London has its black cabs. New York has its yellow cabs. Um, I don't know, maybe your city has a particular colour of, uh, of taxi. I don't know. Okay, so um, what about ferries? A ferry, now it depends where you live. If you live in a place like this, which is obviously Venice, and it's just down the road, well, down the road, it's about an hour and a half on the train from where we live, um, you have ferries which are taking people around different parts of uh, different parts of the city. So I think some of the classic ones we see 
on uh, on the uh, the films and in uh, in television, uh, the ferry which takes people across from one side of the um, the river to the other in New, in New York, for example. In Venice, we have the Vaporetto, uh, the Vaporetti, which are um, it's it's essentially like a bus and it goes along the canal and it drops people off and it picks people up and it moves people around. Um, you have lorries and you have trucks which are uh, bigger vehicles for transporting goods and materials from factories to ports and to cities. Um, you may have come across this term supply chain and this is, I think this is a term which I think we're going to use a little bit because um, particularly when we talk about food uh, and when we talk about uh, how food gets from the farmer to your table, um, quite often this is part of the, uh, the modern world that we take for granted because uh, we just go to the shop and we buy the thing, but we don't really think about how that thing, how did those pineapples get to the supermarket? Well, no one around here grows pineapples. How did the bananas get here? <laughs> okay, And it's clear there's, there's transport, and it's, uh, all of this transport is involving um, energy, it's involving fuel, it's involving pollution. So there's a whole, there's a whole part of this, uh, let's say there's a whole sort of story behind these. Um, okay, so we might have vans, you might have a van, uh, which is a small, um, uh, a smaller than, they're smaller than lorries, but bigger than cars. Um, these are classic, uh, classic vehicles for, um, for small businesses. The, the, the plumber might have a van with a picture of a tap and a, and a, and a wrench on it. Um, and then of course we have uh, private transport like cars and bikes and motorbikes and scooters. So um, you can ask, you know, how do you, how do you get around? Do you, do you use your car all the time? Do you move around uh, or do you go on a motorbike? Do you have a Harley Davidson? Or do you have a, uh, a Cinquantina? Do you have a, 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 a scooter like a, a Lambretta or something, something iconic? Okay, um, uh, I don't know whether you like going on. Uh, excuse me. I don't know whether you like going on uh, on on a bike. Um, this is a guy who obviously is quite a character. He's got a, a nice top hat on. So um, before you start your trip or your, your journey, a trip is typically something which is fairly short, but it could be it could be used colloquially colloquially uh, to describe something which is uh, um, which is a bit uh, a bit longer. So uh, we, you get in the car and then you drive off. Now, um, this brings me to uh, a part of, let's say, part of grammar, uh, grammar vocabulary, which is uh, the bugbear, it's the nightmare for many uh, students who are learning English. Um, it's the infamous, they are the infamous phrasal verbs. And the thing with phrasal verbs, as you may or may not know, is that they are made up of one verb plus one or more prepositions. And the problem is that while some of them are fairly, let's say, fairly clear what they mean, um, others, particularly the colloquial phrases, are extremely difficult to guess the meaning of because uh, they have a uh, they have a colloquial meaning which you cannot guess from the combination. The other thing is that sometimes the phrasals, uh, the, the choice of preposition is, um, let's say, uh, fairly obvious. So you, if you think about it, you get in a car. 
because you actually open the door and you go inside it so you get in a car um, but to drive off well you drive off what you drive off a cliff well hope hopefully not um, you go you go <laughs> okay uh, phrasal verbs hell on earth <laughs> <laughs> well, I can think of worse things, to be honest with you. But um, if you choose, uh, oh, so so if you choose to, you, you can go on foot. Okay, now that's fairly easy because you are actually on your feet. If you think um, uh, you can go by bike. Now, this is uh, when you say buy something, it's a, a mode of, it's a way of doing something. Okay, um, you can get on your bike okay now this one you have to be a little bit careful with because uh, certainly people of my age um, I grew up uh, as I say uh, at the time of the dinosaurs and I do remember um, I do remember uh, one of Mrs Thatcher's ministers uh, who um, when asked about unemployment, he said, well, people should just get on their bikes. OK, so that became a colloquial phrase to uh, go to hell. Get on your bike, on your bike. OK, um, so you get on a bus, of course, because you actually step up. Um, you get off the bus when you arrive. OK, so these are some typical. And the other the other part of the of the phrasals, of course, is the get because English uses uh, sort of two uh, sort of different systems. There's like um, an informal system, which is typically the get verbs, uh, and they're typically phrasals. And then you may have a more formal, um, uh, a more formal verb, uh, which is maybe not so used in, uh, not so used so commonly, or it may be considered more educated in which in which case um, it's not so uh, it's not so widely used okay so um, thinking about uh, uh, thinking about uh, some transport verbs okay so we uh, we catch we catch a bus but that's not catching it like this it's stopping it and getting on it um, you drive a car, okay, that's easy enough. Uh, you drive a taxi, you would drive a train. If you, are a tra if you are a train driver, of course you will drive a train. You ride a bike, a motorbike or a horse. Um, you board a plane or a ship um, or a hovercraft, but we don't usually see many hovercraft these days. Um, uh, okay, so I've got catch twice there, but we can catch the next bus if we hurry. That's okay. Um, fly. So you fly a plane or you fly in a plane. So I've got two examples here. So I'm flying to the US tomorrow. And my hobby is flying. I fly a Cessna. Okay, or Cesena for the Italians. Okay. Um, you take the ferry, you take the bus, you take the plane, um, you go by car, plane, skateboard. Okay, so we've got lots of different possibilities here. Um, if we are on the buses, uh, a bus route is uh, the roads, a series of roads, it's the, the sequence of roads, let's say, that the bus follows on its journey from start to finish. Um, you may have, in your city, you may have special bus lanes which are dedicated to the buses. Uh, private cars usually can't drive down them. Um, you have a bus stop, which is where people wait to be picked up. So, but the bus doesn't actually literally pick the people up. It's where the people get on the bus. Okay, and where people get off the bus and the, the the bus driver lets the people off the bus okay so transport very important uh, aspect of modern life um, particularly in cities because of um, 
pollution, because of congestion, because of traffic problems. So um, many, many, uh, many cities are starting to come round to the idea of using uh, using bus lanes in order to um, uh, alleviate traffic problems. Okay. Uh, okay. So traffic. Uh, thinking about adjectives, traffic can be heavy, um, traffic can be uh, uh, heavy when there are a lot of vehicles on the same stretch of road at the same time. Um, if the traffic is extremely heavy, it can stop and it forms a traffic jam. But this is not like strawberry jam, because strawberry jam you can eat it and put it on you put it on your bread and you can eat it a traffic jam you can't obviously uh, to jam is to block okay at least in this in this context uh, whereas jam as the food is obviously uh, something a little bit different so um, traffic jams can be a problem uh, you may have you ever been stuck in a traffic jam What's the worst traffic jam you've ever been stuck in? Um, it usually happens when you need to be somewhere quickly. So you need to be at the airport or uh, as it says here, oh dear, I'm in a traffic jam. I'll be late for my wedding. Uh, luckily, I wasn't late for my wedding. So everything was OK. Um, do you like traveling by train? Train traveling, uh, traveling by train is something which I think uh, it's starting to come back a little bit because uh, I read just yesterday that the French government is um, is looking at banning short flights of under two and a half hours between where there is a train journey available. Uh, so, sorry, short flights where the train journey is under two and a half hours, sorry. So that means between big cities in, in France. Um, I think certainly in Italy, uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen more uh, long, uh, long haul fast trains. So whereas once upon a time, not so long ago, it would take quite a long time for me in Verona to get to Rome, uh, at least before the recent pandemic. Uh, you could get to Rome in two and a half hours, three hours uh, on a very nice morning, uh, very nice morning trip. So um, train travel can be very relaxing. I remember as a student going around Europe on on trains uh, and it was definitely something which was uh, yes it was part of the experience let's let's say and you get you it's great because you can get into conversation with people and you talk uh, you can have uh, a relaxing time watching the world go by as you travel in your uh, in your little let's say your little world okay so um, you get on the train at a railway station the train arrives at the platform or arrives on the platform, uh, but it doesn't actually come on the platform where you are standing. Um, you buy your ticket probably from a machine, but are you going to buy a single or are you going to buy a return? Where are you going with this train? OK, so just some, uh, I think I'm going to skip this one because these are just, uh, uh, let's say, uh, some words to do with um, modes of transport, these are words to do with infrastructure. So we might be talking about uh, we might be talking about getting around in a city, so we might be talking about roads and tunnels, bridges, a flyover, which may not be so familiar, is just another type of bridge which typically takes something like a motorway. Um, the uh, you might have a cable car according to where you live. You may be able to go up a, uh, you may have hills where you need to, uh, you need to go up. Um, you might have cycle paths. You might have bike lanes, which is an alternative to, alternative name to a cycle path. Um, 
and you might have a funicular a, fun, a, a funicular railway this is a rather difficult thing to say funiculare in italian uh, fun, fun, funicular rail but the problem is it is a word that i would never usually say in english it exists because there are they do exist it's just that i'm more you i'm more used to saying it in in italian so um okay and these are the rack railways which go up the sides of hills um okay so uh okay so i've got to a a, a crucial question here but just before I start, I'm just looking at the time. Um, it's 20 past six. So um, what I'm going to suggest is I'm going to start this section, but I'm going to pick this up from the next, when we meet next time. Um, but I'm going to stop five minutes earlier so that we can have some feedback, some comments, uh, any questions. Okay. So. Um, I'm not going to ask you the answer to this question because there is only one answer in the universe. Uh, so you are what you eat, as they say. Um, so food. Food is a, a vital, obviously a vital part of life. Um, but we've gone a long way since. Uh, got a long. We've gone a long way since um, uh, a simple diet based on cabbage carrots and potatoes uh, we have uh, food which gives us nourishment and energy um, we have food which uh, allows us to um, express ourselves in culture and of course uh, one of the things in Italy is it, Italy has a very strong uh, cuisine very strong cultural tradition um, and this but this is just one country there are plenty of other countries which have equally uh, equally strong uh, cultural cuisines uh, cultural um, uh, heritages in terms of cuisine so I'm thinking for, for example India which has a, an extraordinarily rich uh, um, uh, extraordinarily rich cuisine but can you describe your natural national cuisine what does it consist of why why is it the way it is? Um, so, uh, if we think about if we're thinking about food, we should be thinking about food supply. In thinking about um, in thinking about the environmental aspect of things, um, food is coming from a long distance. So there's transport involved. Um, so if you think about your local supermarket i mentioned the pineapples and the bananas and the mangoes and the pears which are not in season and the vegetables which uh, don't uh, normally grow here uh, or the strawberries which are just a little bit too early where are these things coming from so we don't because of the way modern society is and because of the the way um, modern life is we don't use or we don't or we no longer rely on uh, totally local produce what you can grow in the garden um, I remember when I was a kid <laughs> um, my my mum and dad bless them um, they they were of the generation which grew up uh, they grew up uh, 19, uh, I think it was the 1930s, 1940s. Okay, so it was a time when there was not a lot of stuff around, and so the idea was that if you had a garden, you used the garden to grow vegetables. Um, well, of course, this is the north of England, and so we are not growing peppers. We're not growing courgettes or zucchini, um, although they do grow there. Uh, zucchini do. Uh, it's just that they never even heard of them um, so, so we had a fantastic crop of all of those vegetables that children really really love we had cauliflower cabbages and the ones which grew the best of course were the Brussels sprouts um, we had an infinite supply of Brussels sprouts which I absolutely hate but anyway leaving that aside um, the local farmers uh, are providing us with uh, 
certain things and we are lucky here because uh, there is a, a wide variety of stuff is grown here okay yeah good so this is so say we have a small orchard in our school and a small orchard is an excellent place for science it's an excellent place for science get out there with a microscope okay I usually choose to buy from local farmers I even have a garden of my own excellent yeah I mean we are lucky because we have um, uh, what's called uh, kilometer zero which means uh, zero kilometers um, it's not quite zero but it's certainly not the other end of the country um, and when the season the season is starting now um, there's a, a an amazing amount of different stuff and I think that this is uh, it's very important to try and support these uh, these types of uh, initiatives and accept that um, it's actually good to not have everything available always okay right I'm just looking at the time now so I'm I, I'm sort of let's just see where we are okay um, yeah I'll just finish with this this comment here so um, food supply and Got them. we are going to be me this is lovely to see you first of all the system works and we got your, your video we see you <laughs> since the one hour that's lovely <laughs> uh, and I don't know what happened uh, with the video uh, camera it yeah either, but it works it, work. it works it's nice to see you and uh, second if you want this five minutes we can give a chance to well to say what yeah. the participant uh, uh, to just to open the microphone if they want one of some of them and to ask you to say what they're thinking about this lesson it was uh, enough uh, easy for them to understand it to participate if they like it or not if you mm -hmm. what do you say yeah absolutely so okay. do I have to now I do me everything do don't worry okay now uh, because we got the last five minutes with Gordon uh, which has considered a friend uh, indeed after some times and um, you can unmute your microphone and if you want you can just uh, we've got five minutes to collect your feedback which is quite important for us because we're doing this service for you indeed and anyone that wants turn on the microphone and ask and micro uh, Gordon has disappeared once again but I don't know why Hello, okay. Hello, okay. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. Now I see you. Ah, okay. So, any one of you? You are 130 participants. 131 in this moment. Okay. Can I say something? Lovely. Who are you? Hello, First of all, where are you from? I am from Croatia. My name is Maria, and uh, I have mm -hmm. never um, learned English. So I am self-learner. Um, oh. I learn English from my students, from my um, colleagues in school, because I teach Croatian language. But I participate mm. in many uh, European projects, and this is my school for um, English. Um, English. Uh, so I can uh, use some words. Uh, from your um, presentation and I understand um, I think maybe 99% um, so oh. you are very oh. cre <laughs> clear I understand almost everything uh, and I enjoy you in this project because I have some partners in project um, uh, and our team is also how to stop pollution and uh, how to um, engage our students to make you know things better so thank you very much I like it oh thank you well, thank you very much Gordon great <laughs> bye um, thank you. nice to see you nice to see you from Croatia very unexpected and we are we like it very much yes so thank you very much I like Sicily also I have uh, been in Sicily ah. in Palermo so bye uh, okay, we are in uh, Verona. If, if, you, if you like, you should go to Catania as well. 
Okay, <laughs> I hope so. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Anyone else? Reda, that you're one of the. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the opportunity for us to learn. Well, there, are, there, are quite a lot of, uh, there are quite a lot of teachers from Lithuania, and we are happy to learn. Okay, that's good. I, I've got that's some good. feedback from uh, my teachers, and they are happy with the course. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Okay, le uh, let me give some instruction if you want to turn on the microphone, and you're using a computer on the left side under it. You have an icon. Mute and mute and video and so on, you can use it. I think it depends about your system, of course. Anyway, uh, here we have Marian Blanco from Spain. It, she represents the region uh, administration, Castilla y León. And she's. Yes, I, I would like to only say uh, wonderful or super or terrific or. Uh, I like it very much the lesson, not only for the content, who are very interesting, but even your voice, Gordon, is is delightful to listen to you. So you make it very easy, even if the content <laughs> is not is not close to my specialization. I I love to listen to you telling all of this. So thank you very much. And I I know the <laughs> Spanish teachers would be also very happy because the lesson was. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, the video will be uploaded on the website tomorrow, and so uh, you can have a look at it anytime you want, as many times as you want. But most of all, if you want, you can invite other colleagues. We have up to one thousand places for participating, and it's so I think going on with Gordon, you will get uh, some confidence. And uh, so you be maybe you participate more actively and discuss in the discussion. This is a, just a, a crazy idea we had, and uh, to contribute mm -hmm. to announce the English level of uh, teachers all over Europe and in the world concerning this topic. And uh, I think Gordon is a perfect uh, mediator. To reach this goal. So, anyone sorry. else? Sorry, no. can, can other colleagues join the course? Yes, yes, as many, yes. Uh, whenever okay. they want. Okay. Just ask them to go on the page and fill up the form. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Reda. I don't know if anyone else, and otherwise, I give war, the word to Gordon for closing this meeting. Okay, so th thank you, thank you, Stefano. My pleasure. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your uh, your patience uh, above all. Um, and um, well, hopefully, I will see you if, <laughs> if my video camera works. Uh, I will see you, or you will see me, um, in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. Okay. So, uh, stop sharing for a moment uh, the slides, the screen. And I open yes. the view so we can see the gallery of all the participants. Okay. Let's just okay. Start. Please turn on your video for a moment so we can see each other more or less. Okay. This is all. I got only first page, but I know there are five of them. So now that we have moved to the other one. Okay. That's lovely. Oh, Marina. <laughs> Thank you. Greetings. We are friends from Scotland, mm -hmm. from a lot of countries. Yeah. Oh, so the, so the guys from Scotland probably got some of the uh, stupid. What? <laughs> stupid she's, notes I made. <laughs> she's originally from North Macedonia, so she's oh. not really Scottish. Ah, okay, okay. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for these. Uh, to, uh, to participate, to be participating to this uh, moment. I thank you again to Gordon because he is really magic and you will see when he will get into the in details in pollution and specific uh, micro language. He will be very, very happy to keep notes and so on. The video will be available for you tomorrow once again and so Gordon to you.
Okay, so thank you everybody. Have a good evening and uh, we'll catch up next two weeks' time. Okay? Okay, just, just a moment. Don't, don't close the connection. I'm not going to do anything, Stefano.